Hello. Welcome to Gardener's World. Well, it's summer now, so having complained about spring for the last few months, we've got a chance to complain about summer. But it does mean that a lot of plants need moving on or else replacing. And I'll be looking at tulips and how best to deal with those today. And Carol is not complaining at all. She's celebrating fabulous rhododendrons in Dorset. The whole place is packed full of rarities brought here by generations of plant hunters. This weekend there's a special event in London when over 200 gardens open up to the public. And Joe has a sneak preview. I've lived in London all my life and I didn't know that some of these gardens even existed. And I shall be planting herbaceous perennials in my cottage garden and looking at how to spend your money most wisely on these fabulous plants as well as tending to my sweet corn and carrots. just snapping off the seed heads of these tulips and I've never known tulips so late but they are going over and they do need attending to and I know that for a lot of people that is a little bit of an issue in fact I've had a couple of letters of which this is a good representative it's from Nick Shim what does Monty do with his tulips after flowering I'm about to tell you Nick I know about letting them die down and drying them before replanting but they deteriorate and the flowers are inferior is it best to dispose of old bulbs and purchase new ones? Well, yes and no is the answer to that. Because tulips, when they die down, develop a new bulb. And if they produce one big enough, that will flower, but the chances are not as well as any of the tulips you've got. Because what you bought were the absolute pick of the grower's bulbs. The bigger the bulb, the better they flower. And it can take a tulip two, three, or even four years to produce a big enough bulb to produce the kind of flower that you're used to. So if I left these in the pot here now, and these were Rococo, fabulous, gorgeous parrot flowers, they would not flower so well next year. So if you're growing tulips in pots, always lift them, deal with the bulbs, and I'll show you how, and buy new bulbs for next year. So that answers that question. Now, how do you deal with them? Well, you take off the seed heads and then lift them out of the pot. There we go. Here we are. You see, look, there's a nice example of a new one forming. Well, that's never going to be big enough to produce a flower for next year. But it's really important that the leaves and the stem naturally die back because that's what's feeding the bulbs. Oh, these ones are coming out easier. So what I'm going to do with these is to store them. I could throw them away on the basis that they won't flower very well for a year or two and they've done a gorgeous display and it was worth their money. And that's a reasonable way to go about it. But actually what I try and do is store them and keep the best. And I can either store them and dry them and use them as dry bulbs or I can actually line them out so that next year, if any produce flowers, I cut them and use them as cut flowers. And I've got some, actually, in the cottage garden. And that way you can develop your own stock, if you've got space and if you've got patience, because it may well take three or four years. But in the short term, I've got a place where I'm going to put them. Store them somewhere dry with natural light. Wait till the leaves have completely died back. Then remove the stem, clean off any soil from the bulbs, and they can be planted in the autumn. Well, that's the tulips put to bed. But Carol paid a visit to Dorset to frankly revel in one of the season's best displays. She's gone to the home of the Digby family that across the past three generations have built up a staggering collection of rhododendrons. To the gardens at Minton House, it's like entering a whole different world. It's almost as though you'd woken up and found yourself walking along a track in the Himalayas. The whole place is packed full of rarities, brought here by generations of plant hunters. These intrepid explorers risk life and limb. Men like Joseph Hooker and George Forrest travelled all over the Himalayas collecting plants, including many of the rhododendrons that now decorate this Dorset Valley. The Digby family inherited this estate back in the 17th century. 
and each generation of obsessive plant collectors has left a legacy. The Honourable Henry Digby is keen to maintain the tradition. My grandfather, great-grandfather and my father all sponsored many of the plant hunting trips to China. Right. And if you were a sponsor or a subscriber, uh, then when the seed came back, it was given to the sponsoring gardens. And so we would receive the seed, propagate it in the greenhouses and plant it out in the garden. Some of the rhododendrons brought here are now on the edge of extinction in the wild. These detailed drawings, a record of Joseph Hooker's 1847 expedition, show many of the plants that have found a haven in this garden. They're very much technical books, although they're beautiful drawings, beautiful yes. prints. Um, the, the, all the stainings, the seed pods and everything are meticulously copied or painted here. And you, here we are 160 years later or whatever, and, and you know, we are actually identifying them from, from these this descriptions, book, yeah, from and, this book. and from the technical book. Head gardener Ray Abraham's task is to look after this unique collection of historic plants. This looks really special. What's this one? This is Falconeri that came to this garden from the Hooker collection. Right. And he actually brought it over here to Minton Gardens. But the great thing about the plant collectors is they love to keep everything secret. Yes. <laughs> and they didn't like divulging where they got it from, even in the Himalayas. Right. And very often they would shoot at each other in the Himalayas if they saw each other across the valley. <laughs> because they, they, they didn't want anybody else to collect that plant. This is just amazing, isn't it? It's an absolute wall of rhododendrons. Yeah, they grow like this in the wild and we try to replicate the way that they grow. Yeah. So that they can each protect each other because they don't like the wind. It obviously works, doesn't it? But, well, that's right. But, I mean, I understood Dorset was limestone. How do you grow acid loving plants? We have a soil that is special to this valley. This is a natural spring called Lady Abingdon's Well. Right. And, and this is the nature of the soil here, which is green sand. All the rhododendrons are grown on this green sand. So what is green sand? Well, green sand is a very, very acidic soil. Yeah through thousands and thousands of years of, of rotting matter and the green sand becomes acidic if you like as in natural leaf mold because the more acidic yeah. nature of it the the flowers produce brighter colors and what a dazzling array of colors the towering pink of Grisianum king george or the compact yellow of ward eye in brilliant contrast to the riot of purple augustinii but Ray's not content. He wants to hybridise these amazing plants to create even more new varieties. The whole idea of this plant is to create it, turn it red in the future. What, you want this yeah, in red? E every, everything in red. <laughs> right. The bottom of the leaves and the flowers all in red. How do you go about it? <laughs> well, you take pollen from these anthers here yeah and then you t transfer that to barbatum right. and the stigma on the barbatum flowers. Yeah. He can hybridize using the pollen of the barbatum right now or store the anthers for use later. I can cut the anthers off yes. so I can actually put that in the freezer and keep it for a year. So then I can transfer the pollen in a year's time to a plant that flowers at a different time of the year. Yeah and then create that hybrid. So th the possibilities are endless, yeah, aren't they? they are. How exciting. I've got some perennials to put in the cottage garden. Now the cottage garden is evolving and I'm adding in the lovely medley, the random mix that comprises the heart of any cottage garden. So for example, I've got white currants here next to a rose, we've got pinks growing in a very informal mix. So, I need to add the next layer. We've got shrubs in, and herbaceous perennials do that job brilliantly. And just to make it clear, a herbaceous perennial is a plant that dies right back over winter and then returns again the next year, sometimes for 10 or 20 years, sometimes a bit shorter lived and only for about three or four. Now, herbaceous perennials are wonderful. 
and every garden should have as many as possible. The trouble is they can be quite pricey, particularly if you're buying a lot. You know, if you buy a plant for six, seven, eight pounds and you want clumps of three and maybe three or four different types, you can spend a hundred quid very easily indeed. But there are ways of spending your money wisely. The first thing to do is to look for small plants. This is a Campanula, Campanula lactiflora Pritchard's variety. Now it costs under two pounds and it makes better economic sense to buy three of these and plant them in a group than to buy one that is three times as large because what you'll be paying for there as much as anything else is the nurseryman's time. They've got to water them, they've got to protect them, they've got to repot them and that costs money. Whereas if you let the time happen in your garden you get the benefit of the plant and you get it cheaper. So that's tip number one. The second thing to do is to buy a large plant, as big as possible, and divide it. And make yourself more plants from wine. You could make three, four, five clumps that by next year, each will be as big as this plant. So effectively in one year, it's cost you a fifth of what it otherwise would. This is a Michaelmas daisy. Now, all you have to do is take it out and you can see that's pretty pot bound. So that plant has been in that pot for too long and sometimes a really big plant will be going quite cheaply because of that. They want to get rid of it. And we simply break that up and you can use your fingers and thumbs and get in there like that and don't worry about damaging the roots too much because there's plenty of them and it's inevitable anyway. There we go. Now that's two decent sized plants. So immediately we've halved the cost of this aster. Now if I wanted to, I could break them down into individual plants. Each of these will grow. And I've got what, one, two, three, four, five plants just in that clump. And I could either plant them individually in the soil or pot them up and grow them on. But what I'm going to do is plant about four or five asters in here, which will stay separate this year, but by next year will have made one really big, dramatic clump. And that way, for the cost of a relatively small plant, which cost under seven pounds, I've got something that will cost me 20, 30 pounds to buy. Well, there we are. By breaking it up, I've got a really big clump that will establish itself this year and get better and better over the next few years. And that's the spirit of cottage gardening. It's about making the most of limited resources. Nothing flash, but lots of effect without spending a load of money. Now, you may not be planting herbaceous perennials, but here are some other things that you can be getting on with this weekend. As broad beans grow, they get top heavy and blow over very easily or simply fall under their own weight. They don't have tendrils to support themselves by twining, but all you need to do is give them something to lean on. And the easiest way to do this is use canes or sticks and some string. By far the most dramatic thing in the garden at the moment are these alliums. This is purple sensation. And in fact, we planted a hundred bulbs here 15 years ago. So most of them are self-sown. And they do look completely, dramatically stunning here at the beginning of June. And what's surprising is that if you read any book, they'll say that alliums need really sharp drainage, blazing sun. Well, this is heavy Herefordshire clay. And although it's an open site, it hasn't been blazing. But for whatever reason, they're happy. These are the sweet corn that I sowed a few weeks ago and you can see that they've all germinated successfully and grown really well. But they have exhausted the goodness from this seed compost and seed compost doesn't need to be rich and good. Its sole purpose is for the plant to establish. And sweet corn really needs rich soil 
lots of sun and good drainage. And if you've got that in your garden, these could go straight out. I mean, if I take one out of its plug, you can see that it's got a nice root system. That's a perfectly good plant. It's starting to get a little bit root-bound, so it needs moving on. But in this garden, where you've got heavy soil, the nights are still cold, and if it's cold and wet at the same time, sweet corn will hate that. They really, really need heat to thrive. So I'm going to put them on, and then I'll plant them out, and I don't know when that will be. It could be another month. It could be in a couple of weeks' time. Now, I've mixed up a really nutritious mix, which is bark-based potting compost, which I've bought, mixed up with sieved garden compost and some grit, and actually a little bit of leaf mould too. The grit gives it better drainage, but the critical thing is garden compost is not only giving it more nutrition, but also it's adding that bacterial fungal relationship with the soil, which is so important. And just pop the plug in, fill around it, and shake it. Don't push and prod the plant in, because that will just damage the roots. That's absolutely fine like that. Now, although this is a very busy time of year, it's worth finding time to go and visit other gardens. You always come back with something that will improve your own garden. But London is, although full of gardens, not full of many that are accessible to the public. But this weekend, there's a special event where hundreds of gardens are opening up, and Joe gets a taster. Scoozy. London is packed full of gardens. Many of them are preserved with the very wealthy and locked away from prying eyes. Others a hidden gem set in amongst the community. And this is our chance to find out what's behind these high fences and these gates. Park Square is one of the largest of the traditional garden squares opening all over the city. Kevin Powell is the head gardener here. Uh, this is a treat. That's yeah. a Welcome to Park Square. Yeah. This dates back to the Regency times, doesn't it? It does, yes. So how is that reflected in the design here? The idea was to create the country in the urban setting right. as a respite to the hustle and bustle further down in Regent Street. So the planting design of the time was to have a lot of green with definitions, punctuation of the odd spire of colour. Well, I'm so glad you're opening it and you can get in here. I've driven past here a million times. I've driven pretty much all the way around it and never got in here. But it's not just traditional spaces here in London that are throwing open their gates to the public. Garden Barge Square is a unique collection of gardens moored on the Thames. This is great. Yeah, it's what a garden's all about, really. A sense of exploration, finding something new at every turn. And you're moving from one barge to the other. And look, some good evergreen planting. This is Geranium madarensi. This is not a hardy plant at all. This is from the island of Madeira. And uh, obviously it's got through the winter completely unscathed, which shows what a microclimate they have here. These seven barge gardens have been designed by architect Nick Lacey. It's quite a challenge to make a garden on a boat, I can tell you. <laughs> where, where, you. Where did you start? Well, this was the very first one that we did. It had been used for dredging, I think, so it had some silt in the bottom of it. And um, bit by bit, it began to create its own ecology, which was absolutely fascinating. <laughs> things started sorts growing. Of things started growing. Very surprising <laughs> things. I mean, the obvious things, like Budlia. Yeah. Um, but, but some very unexpected things, like irises started growing in oh, this thing. And uh, ducks started nesting in it <laughs> and it was a sort of lovely little sort of ecosystem of its own so yeah. I decided um, to, to kind of formalize the thing uh, by doing it in a rather more ordered way. Your roses are already in flower here and I live just up the road in Hackney and mine aren't yet so you're, uh, you're ahead of schedule. Well it is quite mild here I think the, the river acts as, as a sort of great air conditioning unit in a way you know yeah. it, it uh, protects us from some of the extremities of the weather this one's gorgeous. Yes, Lovely. so this is one of our orchard barges, as you can see, meddlers, yes. which have done incredibly well. They're very, very happy. They really? And Beautiful very productive trees, as well. They? Yeah, we get a tremendous crop off these in the autumn. Yeah. And lots of lovely meddler jelly. 
I'm just so impressed. It's a real garden here. It's got trees, it's got shrubs and perennials and edibles, everything you want here, really. It's amazing how well things do, isn't it? And down here, am I right that you've got some bees somewhere? Indeed we do. Um, some bees which have turned out to be very, very happy here. They managed to uh, deal with two big tides a day. They go up and down by seven or eight metres, 25 feet. And they every, still find their way home. Indeed they do. On the other side of the river is the Lillington and Longmore estate, an urban housing development built in the 60s with open spaces in mind. They've taken part in open garden squares for eight years now. Jim Myers looks after the communal spaces. Jim, this estate is known locally as the Hanging Gardens of Pimlico. That's right. But there's several gardens within this estate. Here is the exotic garden. Yeah. Then we've got what are called the med beds with the Mediterranean-style plants in. There's a sensory garden which sort of deals with smells, feels. There's a sort of small woodland-style garden at the far end which is left to grow a bit wild. Yeah, there's a multitude of gardens beside all the gardens that people have in their uh, balconies. Yeah, then you've got and the balconies and everybody overlooking it and people yeah. are gardening on, on their rooftop spaces and everything. It's, it's, it's fantastic. Many of Lillington's residents are keen gardeners, including Sancha. She was attracted to the estate because of its gardens. Wow, it's a little paradise in the sky, isn't it? Yes, my yeah. little bit of paradise. You're a bit of a plantaholic, I can tell. Yes, uh, yes. And you've got an orchard at the back here as well, plenty of trees. Yeah. And lots of soft fruit as well. Feels like proper horticulture is going on here. It's not yep. just mowing lawns and cutting a few trees back. No, the gardeners work so hard and keep them looking great. And that was another attraction when I came here. But there obviously were gardeners all over the place. There's a myriad of gardens to experience during this open garden square weekend, whether it's Lillington, barge gardens on the Thames, or traditional squares like Park Crescent. I've lived in London all my life, and I didn't know that some of these gardens even existed. It just reflects the diversity, not only of horticulture, but the communities that come together and get to know each other through gardening. The Open Garden Squares weekend means that there are over 200 gardens open this weekend, many of them normally closed, and you can get details about all of them from our website. Now, moving from wonderful gardens that are only open occasionally to the everyday tasks of growing vegetables. And I've got some carrots growing here, and they've germinated and are growing up. But although I try to sow them as thinly as possible, there are the old clumps, and they're a little bit thick, and I want to thin them. The reason why you thin carrots is so that the ones that are left behind are a decent size. If you have a mass growing together in a clump, they'll all be small. So if you want them to be a little bit bigger, you do need to give them a bit more room. The process is dead easy. You just sort through them, and you want to leave about a finger's width between them. So start pulling them up gently, and you can see the size of carrot I'm pulling out is absolutely minute. You can do this job at any stage, but like this, the earlier I do it, the sooner the ones left behind will grow. Now, this thinning process is not difficult, but it is fraught with one big problem and that is that carrots have a wonderful carroty aroma so even something as tiny as that it's got the most delicious carroty smell and as well as pleasing you it's thrilling the carrot fly now carrot fly can smell carrots apparently from as far away as half a mile so they smell it and they come zooming in and they know where to lay their eggs they lay their eggs on the surface of the soil, right next to the carrot, they hatch, they go down, and then the grubs eat through the roots as they grow. And you end up with the familiar holes that go right through it. And carrot fly are a nuisance. So you want to deter them. There are two ways of doing this. One is to do as I've done, which is to grow a baffle. So I've put shallots in here simply to provide another scent. And Alliums of all kinds are traditionally used, chives, onions, shallots, garlic, in amongst carrots to deter the carrot fly. The other thing you can do is to provide a barrier because carrot fly only fly about four foot high. So if you have a barrier of some sort round the bed of carrots, that works to some extent. Finally, do your thinning at dusk. 
because the carrot fly are much less likely to fly at night. Put all that together and you shouldn't have too much trouble, but just be aware of it. If you can smell a carrot, so can a carrot fly. Now this is only a little job, but it is worth keeping on top of this sort of thing. In fact, that is the key to good vegetable growing, is lots of attention to detail, but in small doses. You don't have to have great heroic tasks. 20 minutes here and there is usually enough, especially this time of year. And of course, this time of year, we're starting to get harvest. It's starting to deliver, as well as take our time and energy. Anyway, that's it for this week. See you next week here at Long Meadow. Till then, bye-bye. Thank <music> you.